Hey everybody, I hope you're having a great weekend. I am um, wanted to jump on here and get my regular video out for this month. And honestly and truly, I had planned to go a different direction for this month talking about love because it is February, the love month, but true to God's nature, He had other plans. And it's something that I think most everybody has heard about this year. It's on some news channels and it's not on others. I'm not going to get into the politics why, but I'm talking about the revival. And I'm not talking about Asbury revival. I'm talking about the revival that's breaking out at other colleges. One of my um, friends shared with me about there's revival breaking out in Central America, there's in Uganda. I mean, there's revival breaking out around the world. So do not think that God is just moving at Asbury or here in the United States. It's happening around the world. And I'm not, I don't say that to knock Asbury College because honestly, I am a fan of the college. In fact, my junior year of high school, my best friend and I took a trip to Asbury for a college experience weekend and I still have the um, sweatshirt that I bought there back in the early 90s to prove it. But what, what to make a long story short, when we got back, my best friend's father, who was a pastor and missionary with a heart for missions, accepted a job in Puerto Rico, heading up a Christian, a Christian school in Puerto Rico. So my best friend, his parents, and his brothers all moved to Puerto Rico. So after they left, I transferred to another school and began walking away from the church. So after high school, I went to community college while my best friend, he graduated from high school and went to Asbury and went to school. And then once his girlfriend, who he met in Puerto Rico, graduated from college or high school, she went to Asbury and they dated while they're at Asbury. And upon graduation, my best friend went in the military and joined the special forces in the army. And he ended up having like a 20 plus year career in it. So Asbury is close to my heart. Now, my friend's father, who is a retired pastor now and still big on missions, he's been keeping me updated on what's going on at Asbury from his perspective, not from what we see on the news, but what he's getting from his contacts at Asbury College, from the actual people at the college. So I'm not trying to say what's happening at Asbury is not legitimate revival. All I'm saying is just not confined to Asbury College. And that's what brings me to what I want to talk about this month. And that is revival. Because I know there's a lot of young people thinking that God's finally doing what they've been praying for. Hear me out. God doesn't act just because we pray for it. And don't think you're the, ones, the only ones who've been praying for it. The last great quote unquote awakening in the church was back in 1904. And there have been lots of prayer, a lot, every generation since then has been praying for revival. I mean, I remember growing up in the 80s watching all the Billy Graham crusades on TV. Billy Graham was one of the biggest leaders in the revival movement. And ironically, no major revival has taken place since 1904. I live in the South where every spring there, there's always at least one church in the community who has a quote-unquote revival. 
there are other churches that have events they don't call revival, but they call God events where there's going to be a healing, there's going to be all kinds of spiritual things going on. But here's the thing. True revival doesn't come when we plan it. Because if you look at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, the disciples had no idea what was going on. Jesus told them what was going to happen. But even the disciples who walked with Jesus had no idea what was going to happen in the upper room. They didn't plan a revival up. They didn't plan for the Holy Spirit to come. And here's why. Because the Holy Spirit is the third person in the triune God. To say that we know what God is going to do, to say that we can manipulate or invite the Holy Spirit to come is blasphemous because if you're controlling or if you know where the Holy Spirit or where God is going to show up, then you control God. You're in control, not God. Yesterday, I um, had a plan to go do something I wanted to do this weekend. Well, lo and behold, this week I have not been feeling good. I really didn't feel like doing what I wanted to do. So God led me in another direction. God interrupted my plans. And that's how God works a lot. He interrupts our plans. You know, the great psalmist said, man plans in his heart, but it's God's plans to prevail. We can make all the plans we want. We can plan a revival, but if it's not God's will, if it's not God's time, Revival is not going to happen, period. Nobody planned for the Great Awakening back in 1904. It was an act of God. And from what I've been hearing from my friends, nobody planned for a revival at Asbury. It was an act of God. It was people humbling themselves, getting out of their routines, and drawing close to God. Then God started moving. Basically what happened is people surrendered their rules and their plans to God. And God is showing up and moving. This is what Jesus said from the very beginning. Unless you deny yourself daily, you cannot be my disciple. We can make all the plans we want in life. We can... We can Give God all the glory we want in life. But if it's not God's plan, if it's not God's will, it's not an act of God. And I say that because a lot of us pray for revival for America and for the lost. But revival is not for the lost. Revival is for the church. So if we're praying for revival, we're praying for God to... Awaken the church. God revived the church. And if you look around the world, there has never been a time where the church has needed revival more. I mean, my goodness, the last two or three years, conservatives falling, getting on the Trump train, and all this hatred coming from conservatives towards Democrats. Here's the deal. Jesus never condemned sinners. The very people Jesus condemned, Jesus corrected and rebuked it, were the religious people judging others. So when we're bashing a political party because their beliefs aren't Christian, we're judging them. We're not being Christ-like. We're being like, as Jesus told the Pharisees, you're being like your father. Your father is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. So we're not called to judge others. We're called to love them and share the message of Jesus with them. Never have we been so judgmental of the lost as we are today. I mean, yeah, the world's getting bad. I mean, sin and Satan is just running rampant, but judging the lost is going to push people further away from Jesus, not coming to draw them into the church. 
as I shared last year, I had a ta uh, a hard experience with the church that I had been a member of for almost ten years. You know, and it was over this very thing about politics. Oh yeah, these people are worse than us. There is no hope from them that they won't be in heaven. These very people I used to go to church with forgot the words of Jesus. Judge not, lest you be judged. And here's the deal. The church needs revival because we are lost. We are sinners also. We know the truth. We know the Bible, but yet we forget Jesus said, do not judge others, lest you be judged. You know, it's like I tried to tell one member of this, of this church, all sin separates us from God. It doesn't matter what side. I mean, that little white lie that you want to condone is just as bad as murder and homosexuality. You don't believe me, you read, read your Bible. Read what the book of Proverbs says, but the things that God detests. Haughty eyes, murder, and lies. God puts them all on the same level because all sin separates from God. We need a Savior just as much as the lost need a Savior because if it wasn't for Jesus, we'd be just as lost, doomed as the lost. And I say this because as we're praying for revival, revival has to start with the church. We have to remember we cannot judge others. And I'm speaking to myself because I'll be honest with you, I've struggled so much over the last year with this former church and and how they treated me. And honestly, I have a I have a lot of I have probably just as much hatred in my heart for these people as they have for Democrats and the laws. So I'm just as wrong as they are. So when God interrupted my plan yesterday, I went down, he led me down to one of my favorite trails that I bike on, sometimes hike on. And the reason why I was down, I, I, I was leaning towards going there is because they're draining this canal out near where I live for the first time in a decade or so because they're doing some type of maintenance. And it was weird because I was down there walking. Part of the canal had water in it. But you get to a certain point and the canal is drained. You can literally see people down on the bottom of this canal playing with their dogs, fishing, and what little water is there. You see all these roots down that were under the canal for hundreds of years that have been covered up by the water. But you would never know it unless the canal had been drained. And it was just like God was just talking to me, you know, empty yourself. Until we enter ourselves, we, we don't really see what's deep down in, our, in ourselves, just like this canal. I talked to another friend who lives near the canal, and he told me that they usually drain this canal every few years for maintenance. And it's routine. And it's like he said in the past, when they've drained the canal, they found sunken boats, sunken ships, sunken trucks, sun sunken cars, are in the, all on the bottom of this canal that had been drained. But while it's full of water, you don't know what's below the surface. A lot of time in our lives, in Christians' lives in the church, we are so full of ourselves, we forget what's below, below the surface. And once we real humble ourselves and realize what really is below the surface, which the sin and the, the wickedness that's in our hearts, then God can renew us. And, and you have to understand, you cannot revive anything unless it is dead or near death. I've been talking about this a lot on my YouTube channel, and I'll be talking about it in my blog coming up. For next month you cannot revive anything until it dies the church has to die to ourselves jesus said die to yourselves daily if you want to be my disciples new you cannot just that with 
what Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. We must be born again. Yes, we are we have new life in Christ, but before you have new life in Christ, you have to die to your old ways, you have to die to your fleshful desires. We have to die, we have to realize there are people who are lost, there are whole nations who are lost that need to die to their cells so they can experience another life. But let me tell you this, they're not gonna want new life if new life, if that new life has a bunch of people throwing stones at them. Jeez, do you remember the woman caught in the act of adultery? She was guilty of sin, clearly in the wrong. And honestly and truly, according to Jewish tradition, what the Pharisees were doing was appropriate by wanting to stone her because that's that's what the Jew that's what the law said they had to stone a woman if you're caught in an act of adultery stone her and Jesus comes up and said no and he he reminds the the Pharisees that he said let whichever one of you who is perfect cast the first stone and you remember if you know the story they all walked away. The only one who was perfect there was Jesus, and he did not cast a stone at her at all. He showed her love, and he showed her grace. But he did give her a warning. He said, now go and sin no more. That's a message to us in the church today. We've been given salvation, but now we have to go and sin no more. It doesn't matter any sin. We can't go on telling lies. We can't go on being greedy. We can't go on being prideful. And for the lost communities, they can't go on being murderers. You can't go on living a homosexual lifestyle. There has to be a change. But if I'm outside of the church and I see the hypocrisy, I'm not going to want to change. There's why. There's no reason. True revival has to start with the church. To give you a little man perspective, here's the deal. And this is why this analogy in the Bible apply about the bride and the, and the bridegroom really appeals to me to a lot. I can know who the woman is. A man can know who the woman is, who he wants to marry. She can, on the outside, be as godly a woman as possible. But if she is not spiritually mature on the inside, if she is not prepared or ready for marriage, a man will not ask her. Now, as we pray for revival for Jesus to come back, I wonder why he's not coming back. I wonder if it's because the bride is not ready. Yeah, we put on all our religious shows. Yeah, we talk religious talk, but if you're talking the religious talk and you're talking, doing the religious show, but you're still dabbling in any sin life and you're still judging others, you're not ready. I'm not ready. That's why the analogy of the bride and the bridegroom really appeals to me because every man knows it doesn't matter how attractive a woman is. It doesn't matter how godly she may appear. If she's not ready, a man is not going to ask a question, pop question, which is, which is not. It's just foolish. And it's not because we don't love the woman. It's not because there's something wrong with them. It's because, one, they're not ready. Two, we love them enough not to rush into something that's not going to work because they're not ready or we're not ready. And that's that's what we see with revival. Like I said, I told you at the beginning of this video, revival started back, the Great Awakening was back in 1904, and pastors like Billy Graham and, and Dwight Moody, a lot of great pastors, Spurgeon and all of them, they all preached great revival for revival. That was their goal. I can talk to my mentor who's almost 80, and he'll tell me stories about revivals he went to as a child growing up. 
these were church planned revivals, but they weren't God planned revivals. Not like what happened in 1904. Not like what we see happening now at Asbury. Not what we see like what we see happening in Uganda. Not like we see what is happening in other third world countries where people are hearing the gospel for the first time. True revival comes from God, not a church and not a man. We can make all the plans we want in our life. We, we can plan things out and say, hey, this is going to be for God's glory. But that doesn't mean God's going to be there in it. And I'm at a point in my life that if God's not in something, I don't want it. I don't want it. Especially if it's something that I really want deep down in my heart. Because as the psalmist said, though a man plans in his heart, God's plans prevail. I, ha I have had so many plans in my life God's interrupted. Just like this weekend. I mean, I consider myself a pretty healthy person. But this past week, I have not felt Help. I have not felt 100%. I still don't feel that good this morning. I'm pretty groggy. groggy. And, but I know there are times in life God interrupts us with illness, with disability like I have, with hardship to humble us. So He can act. And I say that to end with this. You have to let go of what you want if you're going to receive God's best. Sometimes we get so focused on what we want in life and we justify it by saying, I'm going to give God the glory. We don't let God work. I mean, yesterday I, had, I did not feel like going down to that trail. I did not feel good. I didn't, I didn't want to be around people yesterday, but I had to go run errands. And out of town, and just God, I was driving, I was like, well, just go down to the canal. And that's when I was like, yeah, I have to drain the canal, so let me go see it, because I've never seen it like that. And I went and I went down there, I'm sorry if the light's interfering, and I went down there, and it was just so calming and peaceful to see. I'm going to put some pictures of that you can see of the canal being drained. Maybe I'll even attach a video that I took of the Savannah River. So you got the mighty Savannah River flowing on one side of this trail, and on the other side you got this canal that's being drained. You can see the bottom of the canal. You see people were literally standing on the floor of this canal fishing. Dogs were running in the mud, playing in the mud. Little kids were playing in the mud. There was just it was brimming with life, even though the canal was basically in a sense dead. Then you have this mighty Savannah River on the other side, just flowing and raging with life. There are times in life where we have to let go of what we want. I mean, I was last night I was talking with a couple who I go to church with. It was another friend from from high school. He and his wife, he and his wife were out in the neighborhood walking around, and I ran into them. And his wife informed me that another denomination church in the community I live in, the, they are meeting today to vote the pastor out. You know, tell me the church doesn't need a revival. I mean, the, the members of the church are going to vote the head of the church out because they don't agree with the denomination's beliefs now. And I was talking to this um this friend and as we were talking it hit me you know we're called as Christians to surrender to God and if you know anything about warfare surrender means you give up if Jesus tells us to surrender to God's will that means we have to give up on what we want to do God's will stop so revival is more about giving up and surrendering completely to God. Not just the lost people, but for the church. Once the church is ready, 
once the bride is ready, the bridegroom will come for it. And as I look around the world and look around the church, even in the local community where I live, not just the church that I love, but other denominations, the bridegroom has got a lot of growing up to do. We've got a lot of, and I'm not saying that to put myself up here because I strive to grow daily in my walk. And if you're a pastor or a leader in a church, can I, can, I, can I say something from the heart? Anytime you elevate yourself up here and put down another church, you're not being Christ-like. You're being more like Satan. The idea that you think you're the only church that is biblical and follows the Bible, that's elevating yourself and putting others down. That's not being Christ-like. That is not being a part of the body of Christ. Do you remember what Paul said in, in Corinthians about the members of the body? Every part of the body, even though we're not the same, has a purpose in the body. So don't think because, because you feel you are the head, you're following scripture, that you're better than any other church, any other church member, that is not being Christ-like. That is opposite. You need to examine, and I'm going to tell you, just like I told the people at my old church, and and it's biblical, you need to get the speck out of your eye, or plank out of your eye before you try to get the speck out of my eye or somebody else's eye. Because you're just as much a sinner as I am, as a lost person I is. And we know the truth, and we sit. If you know the truth, you know you are a sinner. If you are a Christian, you know you need a Savior. The lost people don't know it. And they're not going to want it as long as we're throwing stones at it. I don't care if it's a Democrat or a Republican. Both parties are full of sin, especially now. The Republican Party which I am a Republican, have always been a Republican. I've always voted Republican until recently. The Republican Party has gotten to a point where they want to pick and choose and throw stones, which is not the attitude of Christ. And that's why I'm kind of backing away from the Republican Party because throwing stones at another party for their sins, knowing you are a sinner is just unchristlike. Now you, I know there are a lot of people making plans for the next election. Let me remind you of this: you can make all the plans. You can plan to vote for the candidate you think is the best. If it's not God's will, they won't get elected. It doesn't mean the other party has. Cheated. It doesn't mean there is some big conspiracy going on and the vote was rigged. It just means it wasn't God's plans. You remember the Bible says God's plans prevail. If God wanted the Republican candidate to win, they would have won. No matter what, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against his kingdom. So the fact that the Republican candidate didn't win tells me that was God's will because he's not there. It doesn't mean somebody had to cheat. It doesn't mean that there is some demonic spirit that kept the Republican candidate. It just means it's not. Why would it be God's will for a candidate who admitted to lying and said he would keep lying as long as it accomplished what he wanted. Why would God want somebody like that to win? Now, I know there are some that people that say, well, lying is not that bad. Murder and homosexuality is a lot worse. If you go back and read your Bible, God puts lying and murder and pride all on the same level. God detests 
a liar just as much as he detests a murderer. And here's why. Satan is known as the father of lies. So telling a lie is being more like Satan. I don't care if you're Billy Graham, Charles Stanley, any, any pastor, if, if you're practicing deceit, you're just as bad as those who are practicing murder. I know that's not the opinions of man, but that's what scripture says. God detests. Go back and read in Proverbs what God detests. He, depri he detests the haughty eyes, prideful. He detests lying lips. He detests the murderers. So how are you any better lying than somebody who is murdering? And this is why revival needs, and I believe God will continue to let revival spread in the church because the church needs the revival more than anything, not the lost. The, the lost don't need, the lost are lost. They're not part of the church. They need salvation. The church needs revival. The lost need salvation. But the, the lost will never receive salvation until the church has true revival and turns from its wicked ways. So as I close, I want to remind you to let God interrupt your plans, just like I had to let him interrupt my plans this week. Die to yourself and see what God has in store. Isn't that what faith's all about? Trusting God? Not ourselves, not our plans. So until next time, have a great week and enjoy the rest of Lent if you're participating in Lent. I mean, Lent, Lent if, if, if you are participating in Lent, you have to deny yourself. You have to change something. That, isn't that what Lent's all about? That's enough.